Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. On July 3rd, shortly after midnight, Baghdad suffered its most devastating car bomb since the U.S. invaded in 2003. The death toll has now reached over 250, with hundreds more wounded, as a truck filled with explosives, explosives detonated in a busy part of Baghdad at the end of Holy Ramadan celebrations. The bomb exploded in a mostly Shia neighborhood, and the Islamic State, which adheres to Sunni denomination of Islam, took responsibility for the attack. This bombing took place in the wake of a series of deadly attacks that have been attributed to the ISIS in the past week, such as in Istanbul, Turkey, and in Dhaka, Bangladesh. With us to analyze what's going on in Iraq is Seba al Nasri, born in Basra, Iraq. He's associate professor and director of graduate program of political science at York University in Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Seba. Good to be with you, Paul. So the, the analysis we're hearing mostly is that ISIS has lost territory and as a result of this are striking out in, in, in the only way it can. And that, what, that's the reasons behind the Baghdad attack and some of the other attacks. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, Paul, you know, the strategy of ISIS was always to control territory for a time, for time to initiate attacks on different targets in the region, especially with the conflict and Iraq and Syria are not resolved. So it was always a temporary occupation of territory, not as an objective in itself. So it, when they lost some territorial um, um, spaces, pockets in Fallujah and Iraq, they shifted their strategies to attack other cities and, and provinces in Iraq. So it, will, it has always been the case. There's nothing new about these developments. And I'm not sure why everybody is surprised or why everybody believed that because ISIS, ISIS lost territory, that's why they, you know, go back to the old traditional so-called terrorist um, and what, attack. And what does ISIS hope to achieve by car bombs in Shia areas of Iraq? I mean, do they think they will make life so unlivable for people that eventually they will be allowed to have their territory without it being opposed? So if you look at concretely at the neighborhoods, the target of ISIS in Baghdad, let's say uh, a southern city, or uh, Al Karada, where the recent attack happens, or Hail Amin, the work neighborhood. All these neighborhoods are working class, unemployed, poor neighborhoods of Baghdad. The targets were never, could never be the wealthy gated community in Baghdad, where the wealthy Iraqis live, where they have their private securities protecting them, or the green zone where the ministers and the, the parties living their policies. And that's why you can see why when Minister President al abadis convoy came to, to the scene of the bombing, people start throwing stones and attacking, attacking his convoy, blaming the government and the Iraqi state for the attack, and not so much ISIS. Now, in terms of ISIS objection, objectives, why would they target poor working class areas? I, I understand their security yes. in, the other, in the areas of the wealthy, but mind you, you know, there have been successful uh, terrorist attacks even with that kind of security. I mean, if a car bomb drives into something, it blows it up. Uh, there must yeah. be a tactic here. Okay. There, there are three moments that explain why this happens. First, you know, this truck, forward bombs, came from Diyala, which is north of Baghdad. It went through numerous checkpoints without being detected. So, why? For three reasons. And that's what I what I've termed systemic corruption, which the United States actually institutionalized in Iraq. The first one is the Iraqi security forces are still using this so-called, you know, golf ball detector, you know, sold to them by British criminals as bombs detector. The guy is in prison in the UK for 10 years for, the, for, for security fraud. The Iraqi soldiers at the checkpoints are still using these so-called golf ball detectors. They cannot detect anything. This is the first form of corruption. The second form is, if you look at the security apparatus in, in Iraq, and especially in Baghdad, you will see it is inflated as such to create employment to the parties and militias uh, of the uh, government. Sabah, be, be, just before you make that point, let's go back to this golf ball thing, which is it's kind of yes. a crazy story. So this guy yes. created this supposed thing for golfers to go find their golf balls, which didn't exactly. work, didn't find golf balls. Then yes. it sells it to the Iraqi government to find uh, hidden explosives, which, of course, it didn't find those either. True. 
So is the, the idea in terms of corruption is there must have been some kind of payment in order to induce the Iraqis to buy something that didn't work? Because it must have been pretty obvious you could test the yes. thing and see it didn't yes. work. Yes. You see, within the security apparatus, all the contracts uh, have, uh, you know, have been uh, negotiated, dealt with um, behind the scene. So ministers or generals receive a million of dollars to um, secure deals that are unnecessary and useless. And this is a systemic corruption since years in, in Iraq. And, and the most bizarre thing is, even though it was clearly a fraud, and the guy who was in prison in the UK, still the poor Iraqi soldier at this checkpoint are still using these um, detectors because one of the officers was arguing, well, at least they have something to do. So that means they didn't take even the security of the people in these poor, poor neighborhoods seriously because of this class chauvinist attitude. Okay, so, so, so is the objective then of ISIS to get people in the poor Sunni working class areas to turn on the government? Uh, to exploit the ressentiment among the Iraqi population vis-a-vis -vis the government and their states and turn it against them, the state up against ISIS or other, uh, or put, you know, uh, um, forces within Iraq. And I think that this is very uh, strong appeal um, because, as you can see, when Abadi's convoy visited the Abadi scene... Abadi meaning the prime minister, current the prime, prime minister, minister of Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. Exactly. People, you know, accused him of, of corruption, and he is the reason why, and his government, why they are attacked, not so much ISIS. Um, again, this is the first moment of corruption. The second moment is, as I, as I was talking about, this inflated security apparatus is nothing but an employment, you know, a venue for all the militias and supporters of the governing parties. And most of them, you know, they buy and sell their security posts. So nominally they are on paper, but de facto none of them is in charge or taking care of the security of the people. And the third moment, which is so dramatic that the interior minister, al Rabban resigned yesterday because he was, he was complaining that there are overlapping jurisdictions within the security apparatus. That means in Baghdad, you have the army, the federal police, and the local police, and the latter is under the jurisdiction of the interior ministries. And uh, in all these, they have different reporting systems to counter uh, insurgency agencies or counterterrorism agencies or regional security command or the defense ministries so there is no a coordinated chain of command coordinated intelligence and reporting system that makes it clear to the interior minister who's doing what in what place it create an organized chaos that is one of the reasons why isil can operate so easily within baghdad or other parts of iraq and attack the poor neighborhood that they are uh, not secured and, and left open de facto to be attacked by ISIS or any other extremist group. So in, in terms of U.S. policy, and, you know, if, if defense against terrorism and the, the, the talk of terrorist attacks coming increasingly to the United States and so on, which they haven't nearly as much as one thought they might have, uh, what, what is U.S. policy actually achieving there? Well, you know, um, Paul, I argued long time ago on the, on, on the Real News that the, the policy is to create this, what they have termed the creative chaos. The policy is to control our instability in the region. So much, I'll give you an example why things are shifting and why the U.S. is losing more and more control within the Middle East. You see, especially after the attack on Libya and the destruction of the Libyan state and so on, after that, Russia and China decided there will be no other military intervention in the Middle East because that would mean, you know, the, the end of the presence of especially Russia and, and behind the scenes China in the Middle East. They start coordinating, coordinating their strategy diplomatically, politically and militarily in the Middle East to push back against U.S. and NATO intervention in the Middle East. Why they are doing this? Because Russia realized NATO is expanding eastward especially through Ukraine, and China uh, realized that the U.S. expanding quite this Pacific strategy to contain China and Russia. So they are, what they're trying to do is to hit back at the center of the U.S. influence zone in the world, which is the Middle East. That's why the Middle East became, if you would like, the, 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 the hub, the melting point of the rivalries of, of global power 
say, uh, maybe since the 1991 after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. It is a very dangerous development. And many people in the Middle East are saying, we are already in the Third World War, World War and we don't uh, notice it. So the, the, the whole foreign policy of the Middle East, of the U.S., since after nine, 1991, is to control the region qua instability by creating chaos, is now hitting back against the U.S., and it's losing control of the Middle East. And the most dangerous thing about it, as you know, the more they lose control, the more militarized became the conflict and the more dangerous it becomes. Well, I wonder if, if, there, if, if this losing of control or yeah. is, is, is actually more part of controlled chaos in the sense that, yeah. like, who's managing U.S. foreign policy? To a large extent, these are people that were opposed to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So they weren't, you know, they're, they're dealing with a situation created by the Bush administration and, and people that wouldn't listen to the professionals, because as we know now, almost the entire professional uh, intelligence and military apparatus was against the invasion of Iraq. Yes. Now they're dealing with the consequences of that. And, and, and maybe the objective is they see there's kind of an upside in this craziness. Yes. You know, as long as everybody's killing each other, Yes. And there's, you know, arms sales. Uh, yes. No power can really vie for uh, to contend. There's no right. s the states are in no, you know, they're fueling the rivalry, right. even the Saudi Iranian rivalry, which obviously each side has its own agenda there as, you know, each trying to assert its power. But it's very much in American interest to keep that rivalry going. Uh, you know, this maybe the controlled chaos is still working for them. And, and the truth is, that's far more in their interest in worrying about the odd terrorist attack that might come to the United States. Because frankly, it ain't like, like in Baghdad, it ain't likely the wealthy that are going to wind up getting hit. Yeah, I agree with you. World Trade Towers exempt from that. But the, the more recent attacks have been, you know, ordinary people in the streets. Right. I agree with you. And I just I want to give you an example, because sometimes, you know, for all of these so-called terror attack and, and sectarianism and so on, we don't see what is really you know, taking place on the ground. I'll give you just a clear example to, 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 to confirm what we were saying. If you look at, for instance, the involvement of the United Arab Emirates and the conflict in Yemen. Now, everybody was thinking that the, the Emiratis and the Saudis are attacking the Houthis because the Houthis are supported by Iran. Now, if you look, if you look at concretely what the United Arab Emirates did in Yemen, you will see, first of all, they fought with mercenaries from Colombia. So they internationalized the security apparatus. So you have Colombian mercenaries fighting for the United Arab Emirates in Yemen. But what for are they fighting for? You know, the, the, the United Arab Emirates fear that if there's a conflict between the U.S. and Iran, Iran will, will close the, Her the Hermes Strait. And that's the only port the United Arab Emirates has for export import. So when they went to Yemen, they wanted to occupy the Aden port in Yemen and invest there and keep it as a backup port for the United Arab Emirates for its export and import, just in case if there's a conflict in the in the Gulf. So when they withdraw their soldiers a few weeks ago saying, mission accomplished, is this is precisely what they had in mind, to occupy their hiding port and, and invest hugely there to make it de facto a United Arab port in Yemen. So if we look at concretely in a political economic sense, we will see Underneath this sectarianism and, and, and the talk of war on terror, there are concrete material economic security interests of regional and international players. And you're right, it's not only the US, it's the Saudis, the Emiratis, it's the Iranian, and so on. But all kind of within the American umbrella. It, until now, yes. But the problem is, I think there are a lot of uh, holes in, in the American umbrella. All right. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll continue this, continue this conversation, I hope, as soon as next week. Thanks for having me, Paul. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.